My name is Lisa Arcia Rivera. I'm the chair of the center, and I wanted to first direct your attention to our two upcoming events at the center. So tomorrow night, since we don't believe in deferred gratification, we have lots of stuff going on. Anita Perales, who's the vice president of litigation for MALDEF, and who is the person who successfully argued the Texas redistricting cases before the Supreme Court, and who is, frankly, a rock star, is going to be here talking about those cases <coughs> and showing you what she actually argued in front of the court. Um, in order to justify the, the court intervening and saying that Texas had to go back to the drawing board and in fact draw the districts in a more equitable way. So it's going to be from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock uh, in the law school, 110 Volt Hall from 6 to 6 30 is a reception. So we always provide food, so there'll be food and wine actually at this one. And then her talk is from 6 30 to 8. So please join us. And then our last event of the year is Abel Valenzuela, who is a professor and chair of Chicano Latino Studies at uh, UCLA, will be speaking on uh, regulating informality, worker centers, and day labor. Um, Professor Valenzuela is arguably the premier expert on day labor and, and labor issues among Latinos, and so he's an, also an amazing speaker, and um, we encourage you to come. It's the same format as, as this talk, 4 to 5.30, Thursday afternoon, May 3rd, and will be followed by a reception, as, as this talk will be as well. <clears throat> Today, we are privileged to have Professor Patricia Sabella from UC Santa Cruz, the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies here, talking about her new book, I'm Neither Here Nor There, Mexicans, Quotidian Struggles with Migration and Poverty. Um, the book is actually for sale in the parlor, so after the talk, um, if you want to purchase the book, they are there, and I'm sure Professor Sabella will be Thrilled. <laughs> Thrilled to sign them uh, for you. So um, it's not, you know, and it'll look very pretty on your bookshelf. It's one of the <laughs> nicest covers I've seen in a, in a very long time. Um, my, Professor Sabella got her PhD in anthropology from here, from Cal, so go Bears. We're always happy to have, bring Cal people back to talk. Her areas of research encompass Chicano Latino studies, feminist studies, women's work in domestic labor, and U.S. Mexican transnational migration. Um, she is a prolific scholar. She has either co-edited or co-authored uh, books entitled Chicana Feminisms, Telling to Live, Women and Migration in U.S. Mexico in the U.S. Mexico borderland, and Mexicans in California. She also, along with Denise Segura, co-edited a special issue of the journal Gender and Society um, entitled Gendered Borderlands. Um, she has received uh, numerous awards in her career, including in 2010, she received the Distinguished Career Achievement in the Critical Study of North America from the Society for the Anthropology of North America. She received in 2006 a Scholar of the Year Award from the UC Santa Cruz's Chicano Latino Research Center. Um, she also was the 2003 Knox Scholar of the Year from the National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies and received an Outstanding Book Award from the Gustavus, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, Correctly, Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights for um, the Telling to Live volume, which is Testimonios of Latinas. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's an amazing, amazing piece of work. And I just have to say what an honor it is for me to be introducing Professor Zoe. I've been an admirer of her work for a very long time. And the thing that impresses me most about her, I've talked to people in anthropology, American studies, Chicano studies. Um, fellow colleagues in her department, other faculty and students, and no one has ever, that I've ever spoken to, has said anything bad. <laughs> in fact, everyone has just said that you are a wonderful person and scholar and mentor, and having been in this profession for a while, I realize how hard it is to have that golden of a reputation. It really speaks to um, how wonderfully you behave and, and deal with other people in this profession, and so it is a tremendous pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you. set up in my department of Latin American and Latino Studies, so I really encourage people to buy a book. Uh, and I also want to point out this amazing artwork that, um, I guess I don't have my book in front of me, 
Um, so this, the cover is um, a piece of art by Jose Ramirez, who is an artist who actually got his MFA in art here at Berkeley. And I really had to fight with the press to, uh, for them to accept it as a cover. It's called Border Crossings 2006. And what I like about it, it's not projecting as well as it should. But on the cover, you can see people who are amassed as if they're waiting to migrate. Um, but yet you can't tell where the border is. Um, so the, the difference between the United States and Mexico, the, a very important border, is sort of um, erased here. He's got all of these buses and trucks going towards Mexico to pick, pick people up, which I love. I think it sort of represents the importance of Mexican labor in the United States and really sort of contests the discourse of the brown hordes that Alto Santa Ana talks about so forcefully. And um, the only way I could get uh, Duke to accept it um, as artwork is if they stretched it around. So on the other side of the border um, is California. And here's where people come to labor but also to form families and intimate relationships. And I think it really captures what I'm trying to do uh, in this book theoretically, but also in terms of my conceptual framework. So I'm going to sort of go through a little bit of what my book is about, hopefully entice you all to pick up a copy. And then because this is for the uh, Latino Policy Project, um, the last part of my talk will be um, focusing on an article that is work in progress. I would really uh, appreciate uh, your feedback on where I'm going there. Um, so, um, in the last part, I will uh, talk about the policy implications of uh, the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, which passed over 25 years ago. Um, and I will trace three unintended consequences of IRCA related to families. First, those who qualified for permanent residence were usually men. Secondly, the family reunification mechanisms of IRCA led to a Latino baby boom. And third, IRCA does not adhere to the family reunification practices that have been the cornerstone of American uh, immigration policy. Uh, and yet, at the same time, unauthorized migration continues. Uh, and so increasingly, uh, families, Latino families, include the unauthorized. And these social transformations have had profound effects on um, migrant family life. I will discuss what I call migrant family formations, that is, socio-historical processes of racialization in which particular family experiences are constructed within the context of migration from Mexico in the post urca context. I identified four types of migrant family formations that originate in the law's provisions, as well as the post urca political and economic changes that displace people in Latin America. Ah. <laughs> we were just talking that Lisa and I, we both have bad that tech, tech mojo, and so the two of us together are just a recipe for disaster. So this is like the third glitch today. <laughs> Hopefully the last one. Okay. So um, I identified four types of migrant family formations that originate in the lost provisions and the post urca political and economic changes that displace people and pressure them to migrate from Latin America to the United States. So these include suspended families, reunited families, and I'm going to go through and talk about each of these, separated and mixed status families, and occasionally these types overlap. So I suggest that men and women form families with gendered meanings that situate them as subjects in relation to discourses in Mexico and in the United States through what I call peripheral vision, where they are aware of societal expectations and social and economic options in both countries. Further, men and women perceive borders within their families based on legal status, language, or different social expectations that differentiate migrants from Mexico from Mexican Americans, which family members must negotiate in daily life. And then at the end, I'll talk about the policy implications of these transformations. So it was important in the book um, to historicize the experiences of migrants and Mexican Americans. So my book charts the changing legislation and border enforcement practices that take place in a political climate of racial nativism. According to George Sanchez, racial nativism uh, begins with extreme resentment towards languages other than English and fear that linguistic difference will undermine the American nation. Racial nativists believe that migrants take advantage of racial quote unquote preference entitlements and fear the drain of public resources by migrants, particularly their utilization of welfare 
education, and health care services. These fears are e evident in the punitive laws passed in many states, most notoriously in Alabama and Arizona. They remind me of the deportation campaigns of the 1930s in which the overwhelming majority were U.S. citizens. The 20th century history of immigration policy and border enforcement, such as Operation Wetback of the 1950s or Operation Hold the Line of 1994, and so many others that target and demonize Mexicans. Today, racial nativ nativism is evident in so many places. I could only focus on a few. Um, and I talk in one of the chapters about Victor Davis Hansen's Mexifornia, A State of Becoming, Samuel P. Huntington's uh, Who Are We? Uh, in a film such as Border by Chris Berger, there's a little representation there in the bottom corner, uh, who was featured on the Lou Dobbs television show in artworks such as Mexifornia, Mexifornia by uh, an anonymous artist that continues to circulate on the internet. These representations, in these representations, the human costs of crossing the border and establishing new lives, especially by the undocumented, have been silenced. Instead, Mexican migrants are represented as risks to the nation and ultimately to whiteness while erasing Mexicans' humanity. And so uh, in the Q&A, if you would like, we can come back and talk about this. But uh, part of what I was doing in this chapter was sort of critiquing these representations and talking about how they resonate with changes in immigration policy. Um, I couldn't, that, that previous chapter was really hard to write, and I couldn't let it go. I really uh, felt the need to talk about how people can test racial nativism. And so the final chapter of the book uh, focuses on transnational cultural memory. Um, and here I uh, decided I wanted to look at, there, were, there are so many different ways in which people uh, sort of contest racial nativism, and I decided I really wanted to focus on musical performances. And so I went and did interviews um, and looked at the text, performances, lyrics, music of three uh, musical groups, Los Tigres del Norte, Get Song, and Lila Downs. Uh, and in particular, sort of did an analysis of their body of work and what they think they're doing, the reflections about their work, but also sort of really tried to situate how they um, sort of not only contest racial nativism, but also the way in which they engage Latino audiences. Um, so, and I chose these groups, of the many groups that I could have chosen, because they all performed in Santa Cruz County and they had all experienced migration and poverty. So I argue that despite working in different genres and, and from quite different uh, subject positions, these artists, their texts, and performances create powerful transnational archives of feelings that construct cultural memory. And through their aesthetics and poli political vision, they forge counterpublics in the United States and globally that denounce the deaths, mistreatment, or exploitation of the Mexican diaspora and present complex representation of Mexican identity. Uh, their art expresses Mexicans' own interpretation of art lived reality. So I really wanted to sort of look at how um, sort of the experiences I'm focusing on resonate with the public sector. And I thought music would be a, a fun and interesting way to do that. But the heart of the book is really um, ethnographic and focuses on everyday life in one region, in Santa Cruz County and on the north central coast of California. Chicano studies has long emphasized the importance of region, where historically specific processes create different Mexican experiences. The research questions I explored, which are sort of condensed here on the bottom, uh, move away from the culturalist analyses to interrogate local labor markets, national immigration policy, and racial nativism, all of which shape uh, families. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to do here uh, theoretically is to sort of use border theory, but to sort of use multi-levels of border theory. So on the one hand, I want to work with Walter Mignolo's notion of border thinking and the way in which different regions in the Americas sort of have particular articulations of coloniality and uh, sort of modernity in uh, the modern world system. I also uh, work with Homi Baba's uh, notion of uh, borders and the way in which people's personal experience sort of resonates with public discourses and the way in which we need to look at incommensurability among racialized subjects and within racial categories. Um, and then I also work with Gloria Anzaldúa's notion of borders. Uh, not only uh, the way in which she looks at geopolitical borders, 
but also the power of discourses of difference and her attention to race and class, gender and sexuality, which create not only borders among subjects, but sort of uh, differences that people negotiate and sort of create complex identities and sort of use these identities as a way of negotiating uh, borders in social life. So um, these kinds of border thinking uh, very much inform the book, and uh, try to, I try to do that at different levels. Uh, the research methods, um, very much ethnographic. I'm an anthropologist and um, decided to do work that was literally close to home. I really focus in on the life histories with 76 individuals, uh, 51 of whom were migrants from Mexico. Many, probably the majority, were unauthorized. 10 Mexican Americans and 15 whites. Uh, and so in the chapters on people's lived experience, I very much sort of go through their experiences and try to unpack them. I have a whole chapter on the actual process of crossing the border um, and historicize that. So it's a very different experience to cross the border without documentation 20 years ago compared to quite recently. Um, and I also talk about sort of this journey of self that, that people construct while they're migrating across the international border. I also sort of talk about the resonance between uh, migrants who come from Mexico and Mexican Americans who have migrated within the United States and sometimes within Santa Cruz County. That, I think that's one of the ways in which there's sort of a, uh, an affinity, if you will, uh, between migrants and Mexican Americans. I also did interviews with professionals and cultural activists, including someone from all three of the musical groups. Um, I did textual analysis of cultural texts, including the lyrics and the websites. Uh, the, you know, their CDs. I had to buy a lot of music. <laughs> uh, I did focus groups. Um, I like this picture that one of my colleagues took of one of the focus groups. I like to call this by the anthropologist. Um, it was a lot of fun to do the focus groups, and uh, they were really um, very illuminating in terms of trying to understand the gender dynamics and the way in which migrants think about the kinds of changes that their lives go through when they migrate uh, to the United States. Um, and I did participant observation, including uh, attending a bunch of concerts, but also um, just doing all kinds of things in Santa Cruz County, um, going and learning about the production process in agriculture, uh, going to cultural festivals, um, parades, uh, etc. The picture over here on the right is uh, one that I took in uh, one of my three research projects that I did in Mexico. I've worked in Yucatan, in Oaxaca, and this one was taken in the Bajio region, uh, which is sort of an, a great agricultural valley that spans um, Jalisco, Michoacan, and Guanajuato. And I'm studying uh, sort of uh, the restructuring of food processing. So this is a broccoli field and a young man um, <coughs> hand-picking broccoli. And part of what I'm trying to do in this book, uh, using board thinking, sort of de deploy a transnational theoretical framework but have it situated in one region in the United States. So it's not transborder in the sense of uh, in multiple sites, it's located in one place. But then I try to think about how do people reflect upon discourses in the United States and in Mexico in their daily lives. Um, some of the work that I did, some of the research that I did was activist research. Um, these are photographs that uh, were taken um, through a project in which I was involved with Binational Health Week uh, beginning in 2006. And this is a task force of about 20 community-based organizations and safety net uh, clinics. And we, every year, get together and organize a week-long set of activities um, right around Via de la Raza. They have these kinds of activities in all different counties uh, in the United States and in Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, uh, Panama, Canada, uh, in different counties throughout the United States. Um, and when we began first organizing Bionational Health Week um, in 2006, there was this real sense that uh, it seems like the migrant population in Santa Cruz County had changed tremendously. There seemed to be more indigenous migrants and more women migrants, more women and families. So people felt like what we really needed was a survey to uh, figure out who are migrants in this county and how are they accessing health. So I was the only academic in the room, and I volunteered to help design and administer a survey. We ended up having 151 respondents, and these are two of the students that volunteered to go to a health fair and uh, administer these surveys with people 
Um, one of the interesting findings was that people who migrate um, to Santa Cruz County, Latinos who migrate to, to Santa Cruz County are much more diverse than any of us thought. We you know, sort of had heard you know, the stories of people migrating from a particular village in Michoacan to Watsonville. And it turned out that migrants locally came from 19 different states in Mexico, and a few were from Central America. 56% of our survey respondents were women, 44% were undocumented, and 16% spoke an indigenous language as their primary language. So well, people's observations that migrants had been changing were certainly uh, validated by the survey, and then there were lots of interesting information about what people thought about healthcare access here compared to their home countries, and also how they learned about uh, healthcare access. So I'm going to turn and talk about um, the, um, the research about sort of the post erca effects on families, and I want to begin with this uh, image of Ronald Reagan, who um, surprisingly enough, I know this sounds like old history, but surprisingly enough was a real advocate for the passage of the Immigration Reform Control Act in 1986. And it had been sort of contentious politics, huge uh, upsurge in racial nativism, lots of <coughs> a sense that we need to control immigration, we need to control our borders, we need to keep those people out. And they finally crafted a, a compromise piece of legislation that Reagan um, appreciated and signed. And as I was doing research for this uh, paper, um, I found a, a little video that someone posted where Reagan, in a debate with Walter Mondale, is actually not only advocating for IRCA, but he's talking about <coughs> the importance of protecting those people from exploitation. So, you know, Reagan sort of comes off as this, you know, sort of great protector in a way that I don't think any of us would ever have protected or believed until I saw this. So IRCA was designed to provide a carrot and stick in relation to unauthorized uh, immigration. Its legalization program, or amnesty as it became known, was one of the most controversial provisions. IRCA allowed those who could demonstrate that they had lived in the United States since January 1st, 1982, and met other conditions such as speaking English and demonstrating their knowledge of US civics to apply for permanent residence. In addition, those who had worked at least 90 days as farm workers in the 12-month period prior to uh, May 1st, 1986 on certain perishable crops qualified for a special agricultural workers program but were not required to adhere to the conditions related to demonstrating their proficiency in English and U.S. civics. <coughs> These provisions allowed millions of unauthorized migrants to apply for permanent residence. Those who qualified for permanent residence under IRCA by using the residence conditions usually were men who were more likely to have formal employment and thus able to meet her stringent requirements related to documenting their employment or residence. With the help of an uncoordinated infrastructure of community-based organizations, churches, and Spanish language media, many unauthorized people uh, filed the complicated petitions for permanent residence. According to Kerwin, a total of 2 million seven hundred and over 2,703,000 people adjusted their status to permanent residence by using the residency provision in the Special Agricultural Workers Program. Those utilizing the legalization options were far more than the framers of IRCA had anticipated, and amnesty became a political flashpoint seen in later political debates about further immigration reform. So in many ways, IRCA continues to haunt us um, now that uh, it's 25 years later. So IRCA brought about a sea change to millions of migrants and their families who achieved permanent residence. According to Jorge Durand, IRCA allowed, quote, the possibility of lengthening their stay in open-ended fashion, the ability to enter and leave the country at will, the option of naturalizing, the right to access social services for which they had always paid but had heretofore been largely denied, the ability to look for better employment opportunities, and ultimately the freedom to move without fear throughout the United States. IRCA also increased apprehensions of the unauthorized by expanding the budget for the Immigration and Naturalization Service, later Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, and the Customs and Border Protection, creating increased anxiety for the unauthorized subject to removal. A system of labor contracts and developed as employers who hired the unauthorized sought to evade sanctions by using contractors to certify the legal status of workers and avoid knowingly recruiting or hiring unauthorized immigrant workers. 
This labor contracting system, in turn, led to widespread document fraud, a black market for documents such as social security cards, greater discrimination against unauthorized migrants, and a steady deterioration of wages paid to the unauthorized. Once migrants gained the freedom to travel back and forth across the U.S.-Mexican border, this in, uh, contributed to their increased civic engagement in Mexico and in the United States related to naturalization, the census, voter registration, voting, and resistance to anti-immigrant policy initiatives, including mobilization efforts by family members in the 2006 immigrant rights protests that happened throughout the country. IRCA did not fulfill its primary intent of slowing significantly the influx of unauthorized workers by its provisions for employer sanctions, which were rarely enforced. Like much previous immigration reform legislation, despite the political desire of restricting immigration, IRCA's contradictory provisions actually increased the number of unauthorized migrants in the United States and ironically did not stop continued unauthorized migration. The unauthorized population grew rapidly in the post-Urca era. Increasingly, women are migrating with, their own support, with the support of their own social networks and without authorization. By 1995, women were 57% of the authorized migrants from Mexico. In the post-Urca era, women make up about one-third of the unauthorized migrants. So there's been a real feminization of the migration process. Uh, the failure of IRCA to stem the tide of unauthorized migration was related to the continued need for migrant labor. It wasn't until the border closure after the 9-11 terrorist attacks that migration halted temporarily and then later resumed and peaked at 12 million in 2007. The 2008 recession, fueled by a drop in jobs in construction, hit sectors that employed migrants particularly hard. By 2010, according to Cassell and Cohen, the number of unauthorized migrants declined to 10.2 million. Further, the number of apprehensions by the U.S. Border Patrol, which is, of course is a poor indicator because people sort of cross and get apprehended multiple times, so it sort of inflates the number, but nonetheless it dropped considerably. By 2010, there were over 463,000 apprehensions, the lowest level since the early 1970s. In this context, many migrants carefully considered whether to reunite their families through unauthorized migration to the United States, to remain here if they already had jobs, or to return to Mexico, reflecting on their options in both uh, countries through what I call peripheral vision. And I'll talk about peripheral vision uh, in a minute. The decision about whether to migrate, stay, or return was complicated by IRCA. The law does not incorporate the family reunification practices that have been the cornerstone of U.S. immigration policy and establishes a culturally narrow view of family. According to IRCA, quote, the family shall, group shall include the spouse and married minor children under 18 years of age who are not members of some other household and parents who reside regularly in the household of the family group. This provision assumes a heterosexual nuclear family and excludes other types of family structures that are prevalent in the United States and Latin America, such as single parents, the elderly, multi-generational, extended, child-headed, or same-sex families, as well as children born out of wedlock who have informal foster relationships with parents or children cared for by their grandparents when their parents migrate. This narrow definition then limits authorized migration because if you don't fit this narrow definition, there's no way you're going to get a visa. And it encourages those who will never be admitted legally through family reunification provisions to consider unauthorized migration to the United States. Another consequence of Virgo is the increased number of children born to migrants who settled here. Hence, Johnson and his colleagues argued that the family reunification provisions in IRCA, that is, once uh, people got legalized, whether it was through the Special Agricultural Workers Program or through residency, uh, then people could bring over family members if they fit this narrow definition, or people decided to stay here rather than to return uh, to Mexico, and so you had a process of family formation. So they argued that it led to a baby boom that will be of short duration. That is, IRCA provided a route to permanent residence for predominantly young men who then brought over their spouses and reunited families or formed them with them here in the United States. 
Further, returning from Mexico after a, re a temporary return home became more difficult with increased border enforcement. So instead of having the circular migration process that had happened prior to IRCA, increasingly those who migrated without um, authorization would stay here. They wouldn't go back and risk their lives coming again. Uh, indeed, in the United States, births have surpassed immigration as the main driver of the growth of the Latino population. Latinos are now the largest minority group at 16.3% of the U.S. population. Consequently, the public discourse about immigration has become even more polarized with debates about migrants quote unquote abusing health and social services by deliberately having anchor babies that would allow the parents to apply for permanent residence. There has also been suggestions that birthright citizenship of children of the unauthorized be revoked fueling racial nativist discourse in which Latino migrants are constructed as threats to the American way of life. Uh, for example, the Birthright Citizenship Act of 2009, which would have interpreted the 14th Amendment to the Constitution so as to deny citizenship to the children of unauthorized parents who have been born here in the United States, had 95 co-sponsors in 2010. The Obama administration uh, has emphasized that comprehensive immigration reform would not replicate the errors of IRCA, but would ensure that legalization would be earned. That is, based on long-term employment, good character, payment of back taxes and fines, learning English, and other requirements. The discussion of family reunification is not seen in public discourse uh, when we talk about immigration reform, but only seen um, in the Latino political press. So uh, for those of us who pay attention to these things, there's this real sort of schizophrenia uh, in terms of how we talk about uh, immigration reform. <coughs> so I'm going to now turn to a discussion of these four types of migrant family formations constructed uh, in the post era. And the first are what I call suspended families. Um, in the current context of globalization, where computer-based technology, outsourcing, and just-in-time planning allow for production and communication to occur quickly, frequently utilizing immigrant labor, the compression of time and space is often celebrated. The underside of globalization is how workers are displaced or follow work opportunities and in the process travel great distances that are quite time consuming and they suspend their personal goals. Suspended families include those awaiting a change in their immigration status by securing a visa so they may reside in the United States with authorization. Suspended families also include queers who are unable to use family reunification provisions to unite their families and also those who cannot marry uh, legally in certain states because of the Defense of Marriage Act passed in 1996. Besides the legal barriers to family formation, suspended families also include those families that experience a suspension of gendered expectations. So one of the things that we see happening is that when men migrate here and live in male households, often they take on what they consider to be women's work in the labor market, um, sort of getting a job as a cook, for example. Um, they also take on um, sort of domestic chores, cooking, cleaning, doing their laundry, again, uh, notions that in their experience was women's work. So there's a real shift in gendered expectations, and they, they sometimes can live in those kinds of uh, circumstances for many, many years. But by the same token, women talk about how their lives change dramatically when they migrate here, and their families become places where they're also breadwinners and also, in many cases, performing uh, domestic chores. But they sort of define working particularly in certain kinds of jobs, such as in the fields, as men's work. So you have this real shift in gendered expectations, again, that um, can last for many years. So people sort of feel like our life is different now than it was in Mexico, and we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, so just to give you one example of a suspended family was a woman uh, who took the pseudonym of Lula Solis. And I just want to point out, any photos that I use are not of people I did interviews with. Um, and Hila Solis was a woman whose uh, husband, they, they had migrated here, um, and then they went back to Mexico, and she said, you know, we weren't going to look back, but you know, we were in Mexico. And then her husband was able to get uh, special agricultural workers um, to use IRCA's um, SAW provision, and so he came back to the United States, and he was going through the process, and it was going to take many years. So Hila was an accountant, and she was working in Mexico, had a good career. And so she would uh, fly out to visit her husband, 
couple times a year. And they ended up having this commuter relate marriage for about five years. And in the course of five years, going back and forth, they conceived and had two children. And so then the, the question became, well, do we really stay here now that my husband has this special saw uh, legalization amnesty? Or do we go back to Mexico where Eva could have a career? And in the end, they decided to stay here. And so she said, for five years, we were neither here, we were neither there. We were sort of, you know, me and the kids were going back and forth, and my husband was sort of stuck here. And so after five years, then the suspended uh, sort of nuclear family were able to reunite, and uh, they were able to move on. Another kind of migrant family formation um, are the reunited families. Um, those who have a family member eligible for a permanent residence in the United States, um, the actual reunification of the family may be suspended for years because of delays in obtaining a visa. Um, the U.S. Department of State estimates that the number of people with approved family-based visa petitions who have not yet actually received their visas range from 3.4 million to 4.9 million. So, you know, people get tired of waiting. It can take, you know, 5, 10, 20 years uh, to get a visa to actually migrate to the United States. So people get frustrated and some end up coming without migration even though the petition is in process or even approved. It wasn't until the January of 2012 that the Obama administration allowed immigrants with U.S. citizen family members who were eligible for waivers of the three and 10 year unlawful presence bars to file their applications in the United States rather than returning to the country of birth. So people who had, couldn't wait for the visas then would come here and then if they had gone back to the country of origin it would uh, sort of trigger this ban. So that now has changed, but for many people um, there was a great deal of anxiety associated to uh, petitioning for it and then actually getting a visa. This change could benefit as many as 100,000 low-income immigrant families. Under these circumstances, family life becomes problematic where some members are left behind and all must cope with significant tensions. Further, reunification may occur in phases, often after long durations. Family reunification then may be a long-term strategy or occur when individuals decide to migrate without authorization and arrive with little notification. Increasingly, officials at the Department of Homeland Security report apprehensions of thousands of unaccompanied minors under age 17 attempting to cross the border to join their families or to work. In addition, some children are sent by their parents with smugglers who charge exorbitant fees and I can't imagine what it means to send a child with a smuggler to bring them over to the United States. Um, often reunification entails conflicts, adjustments, and negotiations which may be quite challenging and may exacerbate other tensions in the family. So, for example, Mariana Duran uh, was um, a separated family. Her husband was here working in Santa Cruz County. She couldn't deal with how long he had been away, so finally she sold all her belongings. Uh, she was able to, I guess she had a temporary visa. Um, she was able to buy a plane ticket for her and her four children. They came and they arrived in San Jose at the airport, and she called up her husband and said, come get us, you know, we're going to come. And he didn't believe that she was coming. So when he got that phone call to go get them, he shows up at the airport, he picks them up, and he hadn't made any arrangements for where they were going to live. So here's this man renting a room in an apartment with another family. So he brings his four kids and his wife, and they're all living there together. And as you can imagine, she was furious. So then she said, you know, she was furious. She told him, you are going to respect me. And so she went through a whole process of, uh, she got out into the community, she did some volunteer work, she eventually found a job. Uh, they were able to save them enough money and they were able to get their own apartment. And she, you know, she seriously considered, do I take my kids back to Mexico? Do I leave this guy? You know, what are we going to do? But in the process of living under these very trying circumstances, she realized that her children really needed their father. And so they reunited, but she, this was, I had interviewed her several years after this happened. She was still not entirely happy. So the tensions can be very long-term and Mixed status families are those with a mix of the unauthorized with birthright or naturalized U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Jeffrey Purcell and Devere Cohen estimate that in 2008 there were 8.8 .8 million people living in mixed status families and 73% of the children of the unauthorized are U.S. citizens. 
while there can be any number of variations, a common scenario is a family with a father who became a, a permanent resident after Urca, younger children born in the United States who are citizens, and the mother or older siblings who are unauthorized. In these mixed status families, the legal privileges afforded to citizens have material consequences in terms of access to health care or higher education, as well as vulnerability to deportation. Authorized migrant children are eligible for Medicaid in some states if the families have low incomes. Unauthorized migrants may receive Medicaid coverage for emergency medical conditions and the birth of a child. The unauthorized do not have access to a wide variety of benefits, ranging from driver's licenses to scholarships, depending on the state where they reside. And even when the unauthorized do have rights, such as to prenatal care, often they are uninformed about them or they worry that presenting themselves in public may jeopardize their stay in the United States and subject them to removal. So people who are in mixed status families are well aware of these different kinds of privileges and vulnerabilities and are very keen to sort of take care of their family members. One woman in particular said that as a child growing up, um, you know, most of her family was undocumented, so every time she sneezed and she thought she was going to get sick, you know, she freaked out because she said, I can't get sick, I can't get my family member sick because if somebody needs to go to the doctor, they're going to be found out, even though she was a citizen. Um, another example is a woman named Aurora Banales who had a young child who was a citizen who was getting all his immunizations and health care, an older son who got health care when she could afford to pay cash, and a husband who had diabetes who got no health care. Uh, because, you know, they, they just couldn't afford it. And she said, you know, I'm really worried about when my older son figures out that he doesn't have the right to go to the doctor in the way that his younger brother does. How am I going to deal with this? So these kinds of micro-negotiations are going on all the time in the state's families. The fourth, the fourth type of family formation are separated families. Um, and the post urca detention and deportation campaigns are part of a long line of efforts that target Latinos, Mexicans in particular. These campaigns and the administrative mechanisms that make detention and removal with little due process have increased in the post urca era. Subsequent legislation, notably the 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act and the Secure Fence Act of 2006, additional funding and political will in the post-9-11 context means that deport deportations are normalized in political discourse. We now sort of find ourselves um, sort of uh, hearing the bizarre language of mass deportation by one political candidate or the, the oxymoronic self-deportation, which of course we believe isn't really possible. Separated families lose relatives through uh, the deportation campaigns such as return to sender uh, organized by the Department of Homeland Security, the workplace raids that send thousands back to Latin America, Asia, or Africa, or detentions for other reasons in which the subjects are then found to be in violation of immigration law. Deportations reached record levels during the Obama administration, rising to an annual average of nearly 400,000 since uh, 2009, about double the annual average during George W. w. Bush's fir first term. Significant numbers of children are being placed in foster care because their parents have been detained or deported, and many of these children will face threats to reunification with their de detained or deported families. Uh, families with unauthorized members who are deported or subject to deportation experience what Susan Coutine calls an enforced orientation to the present. That is, the revocability of the promise of a future occasion by the uncertainties arising from the circumstances or possibilities of deportation prevents migrants from making long-term plans. The irony is that long-term planning is what enabled family members to migrate to the United States in the first place, as I sort of demonstrated in my book. When people talk about migrating, it was actually very rare for people to sort of, you know, just get on a bus and start coming. And there was a huge process of consultation and selling and getting credit and buying tickets on the bus and, uh, or walking, and a very long process that happened long before they actually crossed the border. So when people have members of their family uh, deported, suddenly you're focused on you know, where are they? How do we communicate with them? Can we get back together? Do we go back to Mexico? Or do we try to bring them back without authorization? Is there any way in which we can bring them with authorization? So their whole family life uh, 
is disruptive. Um, and part of the irony of this is that for some families, this possibility for deportation and forced orientation to the present resonates with previous historical eras. So one woman in particular um, who had um, an undocumented member of her family talked about hearing the stories from her grandfather who had been deported in the 1950s and was so bitter that he absolutely refused to come back to the United States even though no parents could leave the way he could. So there's been like a second generation where deportation is really sort of messing up people's families. These migrant family formations illustrate the quotidian struggles of forming and maintaining places of intimacy, love, and commitment by migrants in the United States. Reunited families, where one would expect joy and celebration, negotiate how to accommodate the material disparities in family life, as well as the hurt feelings and dashed expectations of family members who were left behind. Those who live in suspended families struggle to work out where, with whom, and most importantly, when, their families will consolidate and their lives will no longer be on hold. Those in mixed status families are attuned to quotidian privileges where health problems or possibilities for higher education become indicators of possible life outcomes. And those who live in se separated families must negotiate the long distance communication, the overwhelming fears and anxiety, and the complicated plans to try and reunite. In their daily lives, migrants, especially those with unauthorized members of the family, often do not feel com completely comfortable in the United States. Whether or how they can return to Mexico is contingent upon a host of personal and structural circumstances. In my ethnographic research, I repeatedly heard me migrants and Mexican Americans voice the structure of feelings. No soy de aquí, ni de allá. I'm neither here nor there. And just the title of my book. So as they negotiate their family circumstances, these subjects engage in what I call peripheral vision. And this is a bifocal point of view in a transnational subjectivity, reflecting upon societal expectations and possible options in Mexico and in the United States. And I like to use this image um, to sort of try to capture what I'm doing with this concept of peripheral vision. This is the US-Mexico border, right um, sort of near Tijuana and uh, San Diego. And as you can see, it says, you know, high security, you know, this is the difference between um, sort of a country that's very powerful in relation to Mexico. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but those little white spots are literally holes in the fence. Uh, so families will get together at the border and have parties or exchange gifts or even talk to one another. Um, but also, and you can see there are several families that are camping there. And, I was with a group of people and we went down to talk to them and so I asked them, you know, you get ready to cross over and they were like, man, we're just having a picnic, you know, we're just hanging out, we've been here a few days. Well, you know, I don't know if they're going to migrate or not, but clearly there, there was an opportunity. And so part of what I'm trying to capture with this notion of peripheral vision is that there is absolutely a permanent border and with profound implications in terms of whether people can migrate or not. At the same time, that's very poor, so people can see through, they can climb over, they can dig under, they can swim around. There are ways in which the border gets breached. And at the time that I took this photo in 2004, sort of farther east in San Diego, they were rebuilding the border. It was like multi-layers and you know, steel and forest. And so at that particular place on the border, it was really hard to breach it. But then farther on, you know, there's virtually nothing, there's in their sands. And so there are ways in which policy is directing people to migrate through the most dangerous places because it, the thinking is that it will deter them. And they're finding that that's not actually the case, that actually people do find ways to come across. At the same time, the, the porousness of the border, I, I'm trying to capture the idea that discourses in Mexico and in the United States also travel. And so when people migrate, they think about gendered notions around family their own work in relation to how they were trained and raised in Mexico um, and in the United States they sort of think about what will my family think if they know that I'm doing this or my life has changed in another way. So migrants recognize often in graphic terms that life fluctuates and is contingent upon the vagaries of the linked economies and shifting polarized politics in relation to immigration in the United States and immigration in Mexico. As one person told me, it's as if you have your eyes on both sides of the border. Even those Mexicans born or reared in the United States, that is Mexican Americans or Chicanos, um, 
find Mexico looms large in their identities and imaginaries about family life. Further, the borders between migrants and Mexican Americans are clear, exacerbated by differences in legal statuses, as well as generation, gender, language, sexual preference, etc. Yet Mexican Americans are often part of or close to migrant families and understand how they cope with the vicissitudes of daily life. And many of these feelings there are ambivalent feelings, in many of these families there are ambivalent feelings about Mexico and about the United States. Despite the many barriers to full integration that are established, it is important to highlight the opportunities it provided for becoming permanent residents. In a survey with Mexican seasonal farm workers, Brian Wampler and his colleagues found, quote, the collective memory among migrants, documented and undocumented alike, recalls the positive effect of IRCA for many Mexicans who gained legal permanent residency. The hope that another type of amnesty will be provided for undocumented residents helps to explain why so many Mexicans are willing to stay in a political context in which they are subject to increasingly hostile attacks, end quote. Um, so, um, for me, there are sort of three major implications in terms of policy and sort of the post-URCA uh, uh, immigration context. Uh, given the long history in the United States in which family reunification has served as a rationale for authorizing immigration, legal scholar Monique Hawthorne argues, quote, family reunification should be recognized as part of the fundamental human right of family unity, end quote. Further, immigration law should broaden the scope of family by taking into consideration the multiple forms of families and their fluid formation processes where other relatives, such as grandmother caretakers, same-sex partners, and formerly parented children or common-law partners are considered immediate family members. By broadening the definition of family, the extreme hardship basis for removal would expand as well, which could help keep families together. A strong rationale for changing policies related to defining families was formulated by the United Nations the Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1959, which introduced the concept of children's rights, the quote-unquote best interests of the child standard, and an enhanced role for parents and extended family members in promoting children's financial and emotional well-being. In addition, mixed-status families should be provided a process whereby unauthorized members are not removed and sent back to their home countries, but instead are given a pathway toward legalization based on the best interests of children. If family reunification were the basis of increased numbers of authorized migrants, there would likely be fewer remittances sent out of the country, which would be a significant economic benefit for the United States. I've sort of lost track, but it, right around $20 billion gets sent to Mexico alone. And that doesn't count all the other countries um, where people where migrants send remittances. And some of the budget allocated for border security could be redirected toward processing new applications for legalization. These steps towards immigration reform might make the migrant family formations I have discussed here unusual rather than increasingly common. And of course, these policy changes would require a tremendous shift um, in politics. Uh, really sort of a, a sea change in political discourse that would shift us um, away from uh, sort of the political pundits who weigh in about immigration reform and some of the downright scary ideas that they propagated and direct our attention to the way in, pe in which people struggle in their daily lives and try to keep their families together despite incredible uh, barriers to that. Um, if these kinds of changes were to happen, uh, we would increasingly see uh, varied kinds of families who get recognized um, legally, and it would allow them to feel as if they truly belong in the United States. Thank you.